Our session now is around the issue of risk and certainly it's been an issue that's been sitting in the background in a lot of the discussions um, that we've had over the last two days about uh, issues in agriculture and uh, some might say that uh, that risk is a separate issue to funding but of course they're very intrinsically linked um, and uh, that's certainly something we want to explore in a little bit more detail in this session. Um, to start with, um, we're fortunate to have Adam Tomlinson who works for the Australian Farm Institute. Um, he's going to give us some background on risk in ag and, and looking at some of the issues around that. Um, he commenced with us in 2013. Prior to that, he was with Rab Rabobank starting in 2003 as a senior rural officer and later relationship manager in northern New South Wales and South Australia. He then became a commodity analyst with Rabo in 2008 um, with responsibilities right across Australian and international commodity markets. In 2010, he was appointed Associate Director of Food and Agribusiness Research with Rabobank in the Netherlands. And in 2011, he was appointed as a director in Singapore. Um, so he's got a very um, strong experience in uh, commodity and international market analysis and he's also uh, got an in ongoing interest in a farming operation located at Moree in northern New South Wales. So um, to, to give us a bit of a, uh, a starting point in terms of understanding risk in uh, agriculture, please welcome Adam Tomlinson. Thank you, Mick. Good morning, everyone. So my presentation today is called The Realities of Risk in Australian Agriculture. To start with, I thought I'd share this picture. And I, we've heard a lot of people talk about perceptions uh, over the last uh, two days. And I think uh, Australia and in the work that I've been involved in, and, and that's including talking to, to people in the industry, talking to new, en new entrants and talking to people internationally, they see Australia not only as the land down under, but the land of risk and opportunity. And I think this picture provides a good example of some of the risky situations that Australia uh, can be known for, and uh, I'll start from there. So the contents for the presentation today will have four main sections. Firstly, some background information on risk in agriculture. Secondly, portfolio risk, so looking at the value of the Australian agriculture industry compared with other industries in Australia and the relative volatility uh, that's, uh, that exists between them. Then the, the third section will go into markets and enterprise risk. So look at some of the changes that have occurred in agricultural markets over the last 40 years or so, and then look at how enterprises have, uh, have uh, performed from a volatility perspective uh, in the way that uh, production volumes, prices and income per hectare. That section will finish with some comparisons of Australia's uh, gross value of agricultural output to other uh, countries, other major agriculture producer exporter countries and the relative volatility and where Australia fits on that table. The fourth section is on financial risk and that's where a model's been developed and we've used ABARES farm survey data to look at how some different enterprise groups in Australia have performed from a financial risk perspective over the last uh, 20 years or so. Then I'll finish with, four, uh, with, with a conclusion section and four major points. So background on risk in agriculture. So this, this, uh, these next two slides uh, include work from the OECD so this is looking at agriculture globally, which is really, a lot of countries are different, but there is some generic uh, parts to agriculture and, and risk, I think, shows up as, as, as one of those parts. And this table on the left-hand side looks at the four major types of risk that the agriculture industry faces. And then as we move across the table, we look at some different levels of society, so from individual to community to national. Now, if we look at, if we, let's just go into a bit deeper there and look at uh, the, the management, I mean, sorry, the, the markets and prices type of risk. 
at the individual level, there's the management issues. Now, if we go to the production type of risk, at the individual level, there's things like hail, frost, personnel, and asset issues. If we look at the financial type of risk, there's things like income and non-farm income issues. And then at the institutional type of risk, there's things like liability issues. Now, let's move right across to the other side of that table on the right hand side at the systemic or, or national level issues and for market and prices it's trade policy has a big issue there as one of the key key issues for, for production risks the type of risk you have floods and droughts and even technology as a as a uh, an issue in that in that category from financial and a lot about what we're talking today is includes things like access to credit as a major issue in that type of risk and then institutional public policy. So just giving you an overview of what some of the international research uh, looks at when they talk about risk in agriculture. Now this diagram I think is a pretty handy diagram in a way it um, shows you the severity of risks, the different layers of, the, um, of risk from a severity point of view and then how what actions can be used uh, across the, the society from individual through to that systemic or national level that can be used to try and manage that, that risk. So if we look at the, the y-axis, so the, uh, the vertical axis there, uh, the bottom layer is the normal layer of risk. So that's what every business has to deal with and, and that's where the farm household strategies plays a role in managing that risk. And that's where the tax system plays a role in, 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 in enabling the environment and, uh, and managing that risk. Then the next, the next layer above that is the risk, it's, it's the risk layer that, I'd wish, that I want to uh, emphasise a, a lot, particularly for this session, given that we have someone talking about uh, trading and financial products and, and insurance. This is the precautionary risk layer. And this is the layer that's really important in Australia. And you'll get to understand why when I start looking at the volatilities that we see in the industry here. So that's where we find insurance, so crop, livestock, revenue, as types of uh, risk management solutions, which I think is a key word, uh, risk management risk management solution providers can can offer. We then look at financial, so futures and options products that can help with managing risks that exist in agriculture, and then trading houses, so pools and cooperatives and 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 uh, functions like that that can help that can help with um, uh, managing risk. And then I'll leave it with the top layer of risk, which is the one we don't like but uh, the catastrophic market failure level of risk. And look, this is, a, like I said, this is international research, so this isn't just something that Australia hears, but it, it's heard in every country. And that's the safety nets and disaster, disaster relief programs that, we, that, we, uh, that, that play a role in, in uh, that, that level of risk in agriculture. Now to the second section and on portfolio risk. This graph here is, looks at the value of Australian industries over the last 40 years or so. And it shows that agriculture, which is the black shaded area towards the bottom, uh, accounts for around 2% of uh, Australian GDP. If we look at what agriculture accounted for back in the 1970s, it was around 3%. So that significance of what agriculture is to the Australian economy from a value perspective uh, ha has been diminishing. And, and particularly when we heard yesterday how in Brazil and, and New Zealand their agriculture industries account for around 6 to 8 per cent of, of GDP. So, so there's a real difference there between uh, where agriculture sits in Australian uh, economic portfolios relative to some of our competitors such as New Zealand and Brazil. For this section, this is some work the Australian Farm Institute started, I think, back in 2011-12, and Mick Keogh has written an, an article in the Farm Policy Journal on this. This looks at relative volatility for different industries, and this, the, uh, the way the analysis has been done, it it's goes from 1975 through to 2013, and this is agriculture GDP in chained volume measures, so constant terms. So GDP for agriculture has been going up, it just hasn't been going up at the same pace as the Australian economy. But what's the, the main point about this slide is that trend line, that polynomial trend line that runs through the value, uh, the GDP value of agriculture over time. And that's a polynomial trend line to the order of three. And that's what we've used 
for the next, as you'll see, the next few slides and the analysis that's been undertaken. So if we look at how these industries, like the value of these industries year to year changes, uh, we've put uh, a select in group of industries there. So agriculture is the blue line and it swings anywhere, it can swing from a value perspective anywhere from plus or minus 20% year to year. So just trying to show the relative volatility to its, to its trend. For mining, it's about plus or minus 15%. For the less volatile industries, such as public administration and energy, they're swinging by less than 5%. So just giving you an idea of how agriculture looks from the outside when you're looking at all the different industries in Australia. This, this, is, uh, this is some really interesting uh, analysis here in that over the last... Um, Oh, since 1975 to 2013 anyway, agriculture has been the most volatile industry in Australia on an average index. And that's that chart on the left-hand side, the bars. Agriculture shows up there as the yellow colour. The second most volatile industry has been mining, third, finance and insurance, fourth, IT, media, telecommunications. So you can go right down the list there and see that the, the, the least volatile industry um, industries in Australia include public administration, electricity, as was shown in the uh, previous slide, how they, uh, with their year-to-year uh, -year changes. But the big thing, the big take-home on this slide, or this graph, sorry, on the left-hand side, is that agriculture, on an average basis, is twice as volatile than the average industry in Australia. So that's the perception, that's the numbers, that's what people will see, and that's the reality. Uh, if we look at uh, going to those least volatile sectors, it's five times as volatile. So it's just providing you a bit of insight as to why some people might think agriculture is a bit risky from a numbers point of view. Now if we look to the, the table to the right on the right hand side, which I think there's a, there's a pretty important message here, and that's uh, looking at the different decades from 1975 through until 2013. And, and three out of four decades, yes, agriculture has scored the high, or has been the most volatile uh, industry in Australia. But there's one decade where agriculture wasn't the most volatile and that was the period between 1985 and 1994 when Australia was facing inflationary pressures and the finance and insurance industry group, uh, the wholesale trade industry group and the construction industry group uh, uh, suffered a lot more volatility than what the agriculture industry suffered. So I think it's, it's just worth noting that and when we hear people talk about inflation and, and the hedge and things like that, well, this is a bit of an example in Australian context. So now let's move on to the third section, market and enterprise risk. Now we saw David put up, uh, sorry, Sasha put up, uh, you know, the exports growing at 3.5%. This is the value of Australian exports since uh, 1973 to, through to 2013. Now, farm exports in 2013 accounted for 13% of total value of Australian exports. If we look back to, oh, to 1970s, agri or farm exports accounted for around 50%. So its significance to the Australian economy and to Australian exports in the 1970s, much different to what it is now. Even though we are still seeing growth in our exports, uh, it hasn't been the same as some other industries such as non-farm goods and services. They're seeing uh, with mining materials included in that. Uh, but going back to that New Zealand Brazil story, uh, you know, where we see in Australia farm exports account for 13%. In Brazil, I think Marcelo mentioned 30% is what the uh, farm exports account for there. Whereas in, in New Zealand, I think Ben mentioned 60%. So this is what agriculture in Australia is up against. So the significance uh, from its value terms is, is much different to what it may have been in the 70s. And it's something that uh, I think it means that agriculture really needs to, to tell its story about. But exports are still very important to the farm sector and agriculture more broadly. This chart here has uh, there's two points I really want to make here. But the green bars is, uh, um, is on the gross value of farm production in nominal terms. So that's looking at the gross value over the period between 1989 through to 2013. So it's showing that it's been going up over that period, that's great. 
but it's also showing with the red bars some periods of uh, seasonal variability and what's that, what that seasonal variability has done to the value of, um, of farm production in Australia. And that's the 1994-95 drought, the 2002-2003 drought and the 2006-2007 drought. But the value didn't fall to nil. Like it, it, it's, it's, still, it's still, I think agriculture is an industry and we've, it is that long-term perspective. You, know, you need to look at it, as David Sackett said, for the 10 years at the minimum to really get a good gauge of where it's headed. So that's one reason why, and an obvious reason why, we see so much volatility in the agriculture industry here in Australia. The other reason is, is it to do with these exports. And that black dotted line, which, which uh, uh, is lined up with the, the right axis, uh, shows that farm, the, the percentage of farm export value to overall gross value of farm production, so exports account for si anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of that value. So there's a very heavy reliance on selling agricultural products to the international market. So there's another key factor which drives that volatility that, that uh, is inherent in the Australian agriculture industry. So what's happened in Australia over time? Well, if we think it's, it's been heavily reliant on exports for a long time, it, it's been a major exporter in Australia's history, and still is, uh, and, it, and it's faced a lot of challenges with seasonal variability. So the, the marketing arrangements that uh, Australia had to help the, the farm sector and agribusiness uh, company uh, work with that volatility has changed remarkably in the last 20 or 10 to 20 years with much uh, deregulation and, and there's new conditions out there for them now, especially from a risk perspective. And this chart, although the, the green line plots agriculture's GDP in real terms over the last 40 years, it also puts in the backdrop the major reforms that have taken place, such as the dismantling of the wool price scheme, the dairy dairy boards and uh, and the wheat bulk exports, for example. So just plotting in the main the main periods, and it shows the 1990s and the 2000s as being busy periods of uh, of marketing reform. So what's so with that marketing reform, what, what's been done to help offset some of those those challenges? So it's a whole new market for a lot of people who've never had to think about selling their, a lot of farmers never had to think about selling their product uh, as, as, uh, as intensely as they do now. They used to just sell to the pool, for example, or the, the reserve price scheme. So here, this, this chart plots the Reserve Bank of Australia's rural commodity price index. So they provide a rural commodity price index. We don't have to go to the FAO, let's go to the RBA and look at its rural commodity price index. And this is their index from 1982 through until now. But on the backdrop of that, what I've plotted is some of the developments in marketing tool. Uh, so the wool futures that was created in, the, in the wool futures program that was created in Australia in 1960, for example, was a was a huge leap. And I remember my father uh, is, was a wool grower in the 80s and talked about it. And I was a kid and didn't have a clue what he was talking about. I understand a bit more now, but it didn't keep him in the wool industry. He's now in the in the cattle and uh, crop and uh, wheat industry, but. But look, there's developments that have taken place and, and I'm trying to highlight these here. So with AWEX in the early 80s, in the Eastern Market Indicator, the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator in the late 90s, and futures products, so grains and oil seeds futures on the ASX, and then to more recent times, the wheat futures price, uh, uh, wheat futures in WA, and the dairy futures on the NZX. So there's tools still coming online in Australia and they're there to help with offsetting some of the changes that have happened in marketing arrangements over the last 20 years or so. Sorry if you can't see these numbers up the back there, but um, you will get a copy of this presentation. Uh, what, so we've looked at where agriculture fits in the economy over time, exports over time, some of the uh, drivers or what, what's impacting agriculture in Australia from a volatility perspective. Um, at the enterprise level, and, and this is where I uh, have four charts. The first chart on the top left-hand side looks at farm area, crop harvest area, and livestock numbers from a standard deviation year-to-year -year analysis. And it shows that, um, that, for, uh, that, that the, the swing year-to-year -year for those numbers can change by up to 10% year-on-year, and that's analysis between 1990 and 2012. 
with uh, the wheat sector being more vol or more volatile from a crop har harvest or uh, you might call a resource number compared to the livestock sectors. We then move to the next chart in the top right hand side and look at crop and livestock production volumes and the volatility that exists there year to year over that period between 1990 and 2012. And you see that from a livestock product perspective, so that's milk, uh, oh sorry, beef, milk, um, wool and sheep meat. They've, uh, they've vol or the standard deviation of year to year change has been up to around that 10%. So they're the sort of numbers that you need to expect when looking at agriculture's volatility in, that, in those enterprises. But for grains and oil seeds, it's up at over 20% as year to year changes. So there's a big difference between the livestock industries and the, the grains industries from that, from that production volume perspective. Then we look to the chart on the bottom left hand side and that's crop and livestock prices in Australia at the farm gate in nominal, in nominal terms. And that shows that for a lot of the livestock products, so for um, milk, beef, uh, lamb, uh, you're seeing swings of 10 to 15 percent uh, from a nominal price perspective and that's average prices for the year. Whereas for wheat and barley you're seeing uh, the standard deviation of year to year change of around that um, uh, 20, um, 20 to 25 percent. But what, what's interesting on this slide I think is this last, it's this last graph that looks at the net cash income per hectare. So this excludes capital, pressure, uh, capital expenditure. So this is looking at your cash receipts and minus your cash payments. And this shows that dairy, uh, this, this using national average numbers from ABARES Farm Survey data, shows that dairy has been the least volatile from that perspective. It also shows that wheat comes up and wheat and other crop enterprises, uh, wheat and other crop enterprises comes up as, le as less volatile from an income perspective than the extensive livestock industries like beef and sheep. Now look, there's a few reasons Behind that, firstly, I mentioned it doesn't take into account capital expenditure, so machinery, commitments and principal, uh, that side of things. But cropping, a lot of the time, uh, farmers are making decisions year to year. How much area am I going to plant? I know the seasonal outlook's this or that, or this is what I think it's going to be like. And I know what this is the price outlook. So they're choosing uh, their inputs a little bit more discretionary uh, on how much fertiliser, how much chemical, all those sort of things. So there's that there's that uh, um, dynamic at play. Whereas you look to the extensive livestock industries like beef and sheep, they're a lot of the times investing in, um, in a breeding unit that might be a seven or 10 year commitment. So there's health, there's uh, feeding through dry times or liquidating. So that brings in uh, a certain element of volatility which shows there in this chart. It also shows that in this chart um, that some of these livestock producers will carry over income to the to or carry over products to the next year for sale. So wool, a wool grower might not sell all their clip in one year. They may carry uh, the full clip over to the next year. So that shows up in this analysis as well. And the final point is it is a national average. So for for the beef analysis, which looks um, at that sort of 40% uh, volatility in in um, net cash income, it's including northern and beef producers. So the average for those. And we know in Australia, particularly, there's a big difference between the north and the south. And uh, there's not just things to do with um, uh, uh, production volumes and, 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 uh, and the like, but there's also trade policy impacts there as well. So there's that message to, to keep in mind. So we've looked at Australia pretty closely now. It's how, how, do we, how do we compare, how does Australian agriculture compare internationally based on that same relative volatility analysis? And the graph on the left-hand side looks at the period between 1960 and 2012. And this has put together a select group of uh, major agriculture producing and exporting countries. And it shows that over that period, Australia has ranked as the number two, as being the, uh, well, it's the second most volatile uh, agriculture industry for that group of countries that have been analysed there. And that's based on gross the gross value of agricultural output. So that's what, if you're a, an overseas investor looking into Australia and you're putting this analysis together, that's what you're going to see. If you then move in onto the, the, the middle chart there, which looks at the, the, gross livestock, the gross value of livestock output and its volatility, 
Australia doesn't feature at the top, but it's not far from the top. Other countries such as Chile, Uruguay, the Netherlands and Argentina have, uh, have been uh, a bit more volatile than Australia from that, uh, that uh, gross um, livestock value uh, volatility index over that period. The next, the next graph on the right-hand side, it starts from 1992. And the reason why it starts from 1992 is because it includes some former Soviet Union countries. So looking at Kazakhstan, Ukraine and Russia in the fold now. And this is looking at the gross value of crops, uh, crops output between 1992 and 2012. So Australia's got a few more buddies up the top there at, uh, on a, from a volatility point of view now with those former Soviet unions put into this, this analysis. So just sort of hard messages uh, showing that, that relative volatility that exists in Australia, uh, when you compare it to what's happening internationally, you know, it's still seen as a, a quite uh, uh, volatile industry based on, on, um, on, on this analysis. Now to the fourth section on financial risk. So just to set the scene for this section, we've developed a, uh, a, uh, a risk model and I've put up the calculator assumptions there. So this is using, once again, uh, data is an issue in Australia, so you've got to rely on what's available. This is using ABARES farm survey data from, um, uh, from 1990 through to 2012, 13, I think. And it's, it's put down the equity, interest cover, debt cover and profitability of the average, enter the average uh, uh, farm for each for some enterprise categories. Now, there's a bit of a weighting there, so equity holds a weighting somewhere like 65 to 70 per cent, and then the others uh, are, quite, uh, are quite even. So, so th it comes out, uh, w when the numbers go in, uh, based on those assumptions, we come out with a score. And to score those performances, we put A as robust, so that's the purple colour. We put triple B as comfortable, so the green colour double B as competent, so the dark blue colour, B as manageable, the light blue colour, and C, or yeah, C as, I'll call it amber, uh, the vulnerable colour. So this is how, if we look at the national or Australian average farm for each of these enterprises, so there's four enterprise groups put up on the screen here, from 1990 through to 2013, how they've performed from a, from a financial risk perspective. Now let's look at uh, this, and I must say that this financial risk calculator only looks at the financial numbers. So it doesn't take into account the subjective items that you would see risk calculators take in, such as management, capability, uh, experience, all those sort of things. This only is looking at financial performance. So the top left-hand side is wheat and other crop, and this shows that over that uh, 20 or so years, that wheat and other crop, the average enterprise, has been scoring at that, that double B, so that competent, or B uh, manageable level. And there's been more Bs scored in the last decade than, than double B, so, so keep that in mind. Now let's look, which is I think quite interesting, is the sheep performance. And you see here that uh, the 90s was a quite difficult period for, for sheep specialist enterprises, with a few Cs being scored. So, so, um, vulnerable financial risk performance. And then we come through to more recent years where we've seen a, 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 tr a, a triple B, so a comfortable score. So if you're a sheep farmer out there, um, you, might, you, might, uh, you might hopefully have, uh, have felt this, uh, this yourself. And then if we go to the beef specialist enterprise group, which is in the bottom left-hand side, we see that over the last 20 years or so, there's been a consistent score of that B, that manageable financial risk category, with the exception of 2000, early 2000s, where um, uh, there was uh, uh, a couple of years of triple B, which might have brought a few of those uh, investors that people talked about, like Terra Firma and the like, into the market in that early 2000s. Then we, then we look across to the dairy sector, which this is national average, and I've spoken to Charlie McAlone about this, and it's AVAIRS farm surveys data. But this shows that using the same model that we've used for the uh, wheat, sheep, and beef, so we haven't changed it for the in more intensive industry, we've kept it the same. It shows that uh, dairy has scored or was scoring at that uh, double B, B during the, the 1990s. 
and in more recent times has been scoring on a national average basis at that B manageable level with some more uh, Cs, so some vulnerable financial performance risk scores in recent years. So just trying to highlight that and show some interesting uh, characteristics that's happened over the last um, 20 years or so for different enterprises from a financial risk perspective. Let's break that down and look at uh, MLA, ABS Farm Survey data that breaks it into top and bottom, so the top 25% based on return on equity and the bottom 25%. The, the black bars are the top 25% uh, of beef specialist enterprises over that period, and you see there that uh, they've been consist consistently scoring triple B, so comfortable, and double B scores, comp uh, competent scores. You then see the gap between them and the bottom 25%, which are shown in red, that have been consistently scoring at that C, that vulnerable level, and that's the national, uh, nat or the top 25% of the national st average statistics. So just, pro just trying to highlight the gap there and the difference between the top and the bottom. This is my last graph before I go on to the conclusion, so I'm nearly done. But I thought this is uh, probably one of the fascinating charts that I've got to show here today. And this is using that same, that same uh, risk model and looking at sheep specialists' enterprises uh, at the top and bottom. And it shows that the top 25% have been scoring up around the A level. So that's that, remember that model of equity, interest cover, debt cover and profitability. So remarkably, we're seeing the top 25% of uh, 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 specialist sheep enterprises scoring at that A. Although it is quite volatile with uh, some years where it goes all the way back to B and then back up to A. So there's fl flowing through that net income uh, discussion that we had earlier. Similar to the beef though, that bottom 25% has been consistently scoring at that uh, C, that vulnerable that vulnerable uh, level over that period. So the gap uh, is, is it, it's still there. Now to the conclusions, the four main points. Firstly, that risk management solution provider, farmers and investors could do more with a precautionary risk layer in agriculture. So that's that layer above the normal risks. That's that layer where insurance, financial products and uh, trading products can play a, a, greater, a greater role. And I think uh, we need to, to realise that and try and put some more emphasis on that point moving forward. The second point I want to raise is agriculture is generally seen as being in the too hard basket of the Australian economy. And I think Sasha probably highlighted that from the superannuation perspective. But what does this mean? This means that more information sharing is required. We can't just expect people to understand agriculture from the outside when, when they're not, uh, when, they, when, they're, when it takes a lot to understand and especially when there is so much inherent volatility that you need to understand to, to see how to operate and manage well, as, as we've heard. The third point is farmers and agribusinesses are still adjusting to marketing reforms that have taken place over the last 10 or 20 years, while at the same time having to manage in such a volatile environment from production to income. So that's, that's a reality and that's something we have to deal with and, um, and the future can only be brighter. The fourth point uh, that I'd like to close on is that yes, Australian agriculture uh, from a perceptions perspective is risky, but when you nail down and look at the financial performance scores, uh, it shows that most agricultural enterprises are either comfortable, competent or manageable investments. And I think we should remind ourselves of that. Now, that's the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions you might have later on.